This is the Monday, June 18th, 2018 episode of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes for a brand new episode every other Monday morning. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old towns of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello, history lovers, and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. In this episode, our time machine travels back to the days of poodle skirts, I Like Ike, and I Love Lucy. Once there, we'll meet Kitty Tesler, a saucy, scheming socialite out to settle scores with snobs. Kitty's father is the self-made owner of several swanky hotels. But as a child of Russian immigrants, the Teslers can't buy respect from the New York City old money families. Kitty is just so sure of her plans to earn that spot at the top of high society that has been denied her widower father and her. But in the words of the Shakespeare that Kitty would scarcely admit to reading, This is, after all, a time when women were meant to flip through nothing deeper than Cosmopolitan magazine. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Our guide on this whirlwind tour of Manhattan, Miami, and parts of Havana, Cuba, brewing with an anti-Batista rebellion, is Amber Brock, author of Lady Be Good, a novel. Amber Brock teaches British literature at an all-girls school in Atlanta, Georgia. Publishers Weekly described her debut novel, 2016's A Fine Imitation, as, quote, an absorbing tale of art, deception, romance, and forbidden desire. Amber holds an M.A. from the University of Georgia and lives in Smyrna with her husband, who's also an English teacher, and their three rescue dogs. Visit her at amberbrock.net or at ambrockwrites on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Okay, now that we've boarded our prop plane without any of those 21st century security headaches, let's order a vodka pineapple from the stewardess and connect with Amber Brock about her sophomore novel, Lady Be Good. I'm joined on the line by Amber Brock, author of Lady Be Good, a novel. Thank you for making time to chat with the History Author Show. Oh, thank you so much for having me on. Now, we had a start time set about 11 minutes ago here by the clock on the board, and I spent those 11 minutes mostly embarrassing myself with praise for your book and (laughs) how much fun it is and how I could tell from the first half of the first page that you respected your readers so much. And for somebody like myself who reads a lot of books of all genres and a bunch of novels, it's nice to be walking down what you think is a familiar street And then suddenly there's a wall there and it's a left turn you didn't expect. And you say, oh, hey, what am I going to go in this neighborhood? And you're happy that your walk has been changed up, that somebody's not just painting by the numbers. I felt like that very much in Lady Be Good. And then I look and I see you're building upon your first novel, A Fine Imitation. The second novel is always a challenge for authors. And you're following it up here pretty swiftly. A Fine Imitation was 2016. Lady Be Good comes out in 2018. So explain how you applied what you learned from that first novel to come back really strongly here with a second novel that the copy I have here is an uncorrected proof, and yet it's really tight. There's no misspellings. There's no names that are off. It's really a strong second effort. So walk us through that process. What did you do for those two years to make sure you would come back strong in the sophomore novel? Well, thank you so much. I'm so glad to hear that it's a strong effort, and certainly I feel like 
I put the effort into it, and and probably the the cleanness can be chalked up to the fact that I'm an English teacher. I'm a little bit of a grammar snob, and uh, <laughs> so I'm and I hold myself to a high standard there. But in terms of uh, crafting the second novel, I recently went to I took some of my creative writing students to a an author panel. And I was so grateful that both of the authors who were both on their sophomore books talked about how difficult it was to write a second book, especially when the first book is out or it's already been, you know, bought to be published, which was the case with a fine imitation when, when I was writing Lady Be Good, there was an enormous weight on my shoulders to, you know, follow it up with strong work and, and a novel that would, you know, be a good successor. uh, And, you know, I one thing that I've learned, so Lady Be Good is actually the sixth novel that I've really written seriously, so completed and edited. And um, one thing that I've learned from that process is that every novel teaches you how to write it. Every time I sit down to write a novel, I go through all of the stages of learning how to write a novel again, because each one comes with its own challenges and its own low points and high points. So I did have a lot to draw from in terms of my experience writing and editing, but there were a lot of places where I was, you know, it was, it was brand new. It was brand new characters. It was an era I had not worked in before. I'm a meticulous researcher. And so um, I'm always having to work on the very fine details. Um, And then 2016 was also pretty challenging for me personally. It was just a a challenging year. And so I, every time I look at the completed book, I feel an enormous sense of victory that just the fact that I did it again, I think that that's, that's the real trophy at the end of every race, whenever you're writing novels. So I saw something today on Twitter. Somebody put up one of these quotes about writing and it was about, oh, I'm sick in bed. I was going to write this weekend, or I'm just too tired to get up. I saw that, actually. Oh, did you? You might have posted yeah. it. I was thinking it. It's Ambrock Writes is your Twitter handle for everybody who wants to mm-hmm. follow you on there. And I retweeted it, and I just commented and said, when I used to write every day when I was practicing, when I was a young person, if I was sick with a cold, I would say, get up and write something today because you – well, write today, and then what excuse do you have when the sun is shining, when you plan to write over the weekend, and you're just tired, or you want to watch TV, and you have that show taped, and because back in those days, we taped things, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I yeah. said, you, if you write today when you don't want to, then you have no excuse when you do, because if you wait, you can be one of those people that ends up that has never put the paper down, and we will never know, we'll never hear your story, and we want to hear it. It's I hate to think that Lady Be Good is a book that I might never have read because you weren't able to push through because you didn't just keep brushing the little devil off your shoulder and listening to the angel and shoving the pen in your hand, you know, and telling you to get to work or however you write. Yeah, it's true. And, uh, you know, uh, one of the experiences that I had with both A Fine Imitation and Lady Be Good, one thing I noticed is that I would read back over what I wrote on the difficult days and what I wrote on the easy days where it was just flowing and, you know, I wasn't having to think about it and I wasn't having to force myself. And, they, you know, those pages read about the same. You really, I really can't tell which days were hard and which days were easy whenever I take a look at it. So, you know, I'm hoping that that's true for readers as well. But <laughs> the ultimate goal is to end up with the novel and to make it the best novel it can be. So on, on the easy days and the hard days, it's always worth giving it a try. I saw an interview once with Tom Clancy. I guess it was a book notes on C-SPAN. And in fact, I can link it in the body here of the page for this episode. And the interviewer asked him, I think it was Steve Scully, if he, if he ever had writer's block. And Tom Clancy was, he was kind of a gruff, no nonsense guy, right? And he said, yeah. no. He said, I, what do you mean? It's my job. I have to do it. I'm a writer. And obviously he was super prolific, but he said, but writers, because we're creative people, we want to give a name to laziness. Everybody wakes up in the morning, doesn't <laughs> want to go to work, right? But you know, they go, they don't name it and sit there and go, Oh, I can't go. He was like, so that's it. And he was, he was, he was just really dismissive of the idea, but it was funny. He was certainly wasn't a, a threatening or a negative guy. He was just a, a tough guy there with those thick glasses he had. And he was, <laughs> just said, no, I, that's, there's no such thing as writer. We're so dismissive of the idea. And I just thought, you know, a lot of us maybe need that kick in the butt to tell us that, hey, you're just naming laziness or you're just naming not wanting to write. You could find something. You can go to work and do it. You can find something that's productive, whether it's research here, like in Lady Be Good, you can go and you can watch a couple movies from the 50s. You're going to pick something up, I bet. 
Yeah, that's absolutely the case. And yeah, it's a, that's, <laughs> that's a very clever way of putting it, but that sounds like Tom Clancy. So. <laughs> and you have ample opportunity here in Lady Be Good to sprinkle in some of those details that you might pick up from a film. For instance, you talked about the TV box yeah. for listeners who aren't old enough to remember that that was an actual <laughs> piece of furniture that you had in the corner or then into the 80s and the 90s. Your grandmother still had it, but she had a smaller, better TV that would just rest on top of it because, hey, it was furniture. Right. Even if it didn't work, nobody ever threw them out. And so there are those details and you clearly picked them up through that meticulous research that you mentioned, but you have to go about harvesting those familiar objects of the mid 20th century and then pare those down to a number that doesn't slow the pace of the plot. You don't want to be showing off your research. So since you clearly did your homework, how did you go about that process of taking out the pruning shears and making sure that you only had the final bush that was going to be the good product? Yeah, well, I, so I have to draw on my knowledge of the 50s to answer the question because my mindset as a reader and a writer, and you know, I, I absolutely write in the style that I love to read, I always feel like it's Brill Cream, a little dabble, do ya? And so <laughs> when, you, when you go to set the scene, you want to paint it with authentic details, but you never want people to feel like they're reading a nonfiction book if they're trying to read a novel and they're trying to invest themselves in the characters. And I read nonfiction constantly. I love it. And I do want to know what every chair looks like in Queen Victoria's sitting room, but not when I'm trying to read about her life, her relationships. So I think about the things that that I notice. I pay attention to the things in, in my world that I notice and the things that I don't notice. And I try to be really mindful of what is a character going to be noticing in that moment what is she going to be thinking about? But more importantly, why? So Kitty, when Kitty notices the, the television, she's thinking about her father and she's thinking about his decorative style. And it's it's helping to show what their connection is, what their relationship is like. And so it's a detail that's necessary on several levels. It both gives that authentic flavor, but then it also it serves another purpose in the story and helps to make another connection. Then, you know, something that is relevant for the character is going to feel relevant for the reader in that moment. And I, I was inspired by my great grandparents' houses. I was lucky enough to know all, all of my great grandparents growing up. Wow. It was like walking into a time machine. So <laughs> I still have a very vivid memory of what the fifties must have looked like because there was not a lot of redecorating going on. <laughs> Time passes you by pretty quick in a, in a house like that, where it's your house that you've lived in many years, raised your kids, raised your grandkids. Gosh, they probably were there a long time. So you have a bunch of things and you have that memory because you walk in, not realizing you're even doing it. But when you're young, you say, that TV stood out to me. Yeah. And so then you put it here in Kitty's eyes and you say, it's not enough just to say there is a big TV. I was nodding as you were speaking, forgetting that it's radio and people can't see me. <laughs> and then I wanted to put woohoo down and write to remind myself to say that because <laughs> the way you described that was so perfect for people to want to write and even readers who may not realize why some books click and some details click and others don't. And that's that mm -hmm. something has to do multiple things. That TV is not just, hey, I'm going to show you a detail because I'm indulging myself. You're making it do multiple things. You're saying, okay, TV, you're not just going to be there to show that this is the 50s. You're also going to help me illustrate Kitty's relationship with her father and have her have that thought pegged to something. Right. And that's really how every word should be. When she walks in a room as your character, she can say hello to the people there or not say hello a million different ways. And each one will tell you something about that character right off the bat. Mm -hmm. And so you use that moment where she walks in, for instance, when you walk on stage as a, as a stand-up comic, there's an old stand-up comic, one of the very early vaudeville kind of guys and who'd have been alive in that era. And he said, I hate it when people walk out on the stage and they say, how's everybody doing tonight? Because you've lost mm -hmm. them. It might have been Steve Martin, although he's obviously after that era, but he grew up in them doing magic and things like that. And so he had a lot of those influences. But he said, you have a chance when you first walk out there to say something, not to ask them to 
kind of write your act, which is what that is. You have a real chance to set the stage, literally, in their case. And that's what you do here. Throughout Lady Be Good, I found myself almost chasing Kitty, you know, running along with her after her, (laughs) trying to keep up with the plot. Not that I felt out of breath, but just it was exciting. She's somebody that you want to keep looking through her eyes. You want to keep enjoying hanging out with her, really, is what it feels like, this socialite with a chip on her shoulder. And, oh, she has Russian roots and a deceased mother, and she's carrying a lot of pain with that that she denies. And we all know young people her age that are like that. They say, well, I just don't care about that anymore, but I'm going to get even, even though I supposedly don't care. We, right, we've all right. had a little bit of that in our life, right? Right. You mentioned your teaching career. How did your career at a school for young women help you get inside Kitty's head for those moments and to see not just what they say, but what people that age will say when they're trying not to say anything? Right. Yes, well, I am always thinking about my girls when I am writing and not just thinking of them as readers, which I do, and and I'm very mindful of the fact that they're going to want to read what I write. But, you know, I mean, where you can get that free, easy research, you might as well. And I work at a fairly small school, so I have numerous ways that I interact with these girls. I spend lots of time with them. I've been a grade-level dean. I've been an advisor. I've been a teacher. I'm a club advisor. I do all, I see them in all sorts of different roles, and it really helps me to see them in the different spheres that they inhabit where – I hesitate to say that they wear masks because they're not masks. They're just trying things on. But you can see that they're working out who am I as an academic? Who am I socially? Who am I for myself? Who am I with my family? And to see all of that so plainly and to see the different, you know, sort of bodies that they inhabit really helps me to see how the context changes a person and how how we and, and and this is true of adults, too, that I've observed, not just teenagers, but who do I want to be in this moment and how am I going to be that person? And so certainly with my characters, I use that to try. My, my characters have a bad habit of not being completely honest with themselves, of being willfully blind to some things. And so that's based on, you know, my observation of how a, a lot of people do. I think in a perfect world, we'd all like to think that we only make decisions in our own best interest and we are always choosing the right path and we never look back. But most of us are just kind of stumbling through our day and we carry our baggage with us and that informs the way that we interact with other people certainly but the you know the ways in which we interact with ourselves too something that we can all relate to even if we don't necessarily want to as you're speaking there because we all have that moment we say why did I do that for instance Mm -hmm. when I was a veterinary technician we were all talking about the arguments that we had with our various spouses and whatnot and this one girl said oh we we never disagree (laughs) And we said, come on, that that's not even possible. And it just was one of those conversations you have when, you know, no dog has come in with porcupine quill in its nose or anything. And so we said, call him, call him right now and ask him. And so she called him, put on the speaker and he said, what are you talking about? We, we <laughs> argue about stuff. In her mind, they did. Right. Everything was fine. I said, I disagree with myself. I, I'm not sure. Do I want a sandwich for lunch? Do I want pizza? What should I get? Like I, you have an inner conflict. So certainly with another person, you may not always be just putting your real self out there and then you have to look at yourself. And that's a person that we want to know because most of us are thinking, as you said, in the moment, Kitty's wondering, who do I have to be mm-hmm. to be who I want to be? Who I So that I could smite my enemies in her case and get right. back at people. <laughs> Historical Novels Review says of your book, something that's relevant to exactly that. They say, quote, Brock's introspective characters, satisfying subplots, and unexpected but justified twists elevate the novel from a period romance to a suspenseful peak inside high society's gilded age. We've all seen scheming in those romance films we were just talking about, but it occurred to me as I'm reading Lady Be Good that it's a real challenge to read those schemings on a page without having your readers lose sympathy for the characters because they're deceiving, as you said, not just themselves, but they're often deceiving others and they're outright lying to people to meet their ends. So how did you go about crafting Kitty's I Love Lucy-esque plotting and then add in this dose of she's using people and really (laughs) plotting all of these horrible things for people she feels have wronged her and the people she 
cares about without those long inner monologues becoming something where, well, not that they're long inner monologues, but you avoid long inner monologues, as they said here in Historical Novels Review. How do you find that sweet spot where you say, okay, I'm going to show her thinking these bad things, scheming these bad things, and yet not have the reader say, well, I really don't care what happens to this woman? Well, I... So what I tried to do was to give Kitty a real heart. She loves the people that she loves fiercely. She is one of those people. Um, She wants the best things for her best friend. She wants the best things for her father and the best things for herself. But what she believes to be the best things are not necessarily what's good for her and not necessarily what's good for her relationships with those people. So she acts out of good intentions. And I think that is really critical to helping people relate to Kitty because we have, I I certainly myself have been in the position where you love someone fiercely and you want to advise them and you want to guide them. And heck, you know, I'll just take the wheel and you just sit back and I'll drive your life for you. And in the end, that's really not the best way to behave in your relationships. And, and that's something that Kitty really ends up having to struggle with. And so I hope that that's relatable to people, that she wants desperately to do the right thing. She just has her sights set in the wrong direction. It was a real challenge in the initial draft, certainly, to give her that quality and to show that fierce love without, like you say, the long inner monologues where she's explaining it to herself that, okay, well, this is why I'm going to do this. And this is how I'm going to do this. You know, I really worked to craft the relationship that Kitty has with Hen. In the end, I feel like that is one of the central, if not the central relationship in the novel, that there is a love story there, but the real heart is the relationship that Kitty and Hen have. And so by showing them interacting and showing them being loving toward each other, I hoped to set the reader's mind at ease that even though Kitty is certainly not above doing bad things to bad people, that her intentions, even if her actions are bad, her intentions are really good with the people that she loves. And I think, I think having a dog helps too <laughs> for dog lovers. <laughs> yeah, that, I was going to say. Look, she really loves this dog. <laughs> Softens her a little. She's good at heart. <laughs> and somebody to talk to. If you need to pull a little trick exactly. sometimes on the reader, you can always have her talk to the dog and <laughs> the dog's like. I mean, I certainly <laughs> have long conversations with mine. They're very, oh, I, very. I love good. your dogs. Yeah. Uh, and Brock writes on Instagram. Instagram. Very fun dogs. I see them pop up there and I've even sent you a couple of pictures. So, yes. <laughs> but Lady Be Good reminds me so many times. It's really a book that sticks with you for so much about being that age and helps you look back on it and have some sympathy and understand young people. I'm thinking of yet another thing for my own life, what you're talking about there. You'll talk to a young person. I have a bunch of young nieces that are about Kitty's age. And they'll be frustrated with something that somebody else is doing and want to them to change. And I say, have you ever tried to change yourself? We all want other people. Why don't you just stop doing that? And yet try to change yourself first. It's impossible, right? They say, when you, who was it who said, if you go inside yourself, checking around, you know, go armed to the teeth because it's so hard for us to just change ourselves. And yet we say, well, come on, I can grab you and mold you like clay. And then why don't you just do this? It seems so easy, easy from the outside. Right. I'll and tell you what to do. Yeah. And until you have that experience in life, you don't realize that other people are a little bit just cutouts. They're a little bit like actors. When they're not on the stage, they just evaporate from the scene. And you have to learn that in time. And through the course of Lady Be Good, that's something that Kitty definitely does learn. And that makes you feel as a reader that, okay, my sympathy in sticking with this woman, if you did ever waver about her plotting these horrible things, you say, well, this is good. She's gone through a real growth here. And you feel like the good part of her that I recognized early on, it's coming through. She fought to be that better person. She was open to being the person that we want her to be. And we can dismiss some of that stuff as I guess you and I are doing here now and saying we've all been there when we were younger and tried to push that friend to do something that we thought was in their best interest. And we have to learn that lesson, sometimes more painful than others. But she goes through that process in the book and it's fun to watch her go through it and then to be able to 
watch her grow up almost. It's almost like you're watching her or I'm watching her like I'm watching one of my nieces and saying she goes through this whole thing and then she's able to have all those twists and turns along the way and figure it out on her own. But it's it's work and it's enjoyable for us to watch her work through it. Thank you. Since a novel isn't nonfiction, I like authors to read a short passage. You've chosen something from Lady Be Good. I don't know what it is, and I'm always like dialogue, like when somebody walks in a room, a character. It's always interesting to me and telling to me what the author chooses to read for us. So set this up for us and have at it. All right, great. So the passage that I've chosen is a conversation between Kitty and Max, the band leader from the band at her father's Miami property, and they have a contentious relationship early on. He really challenges her, and it's not clear to her immediately why. He's both drawn to her, but he also clearly has an issue with her. Uh, She gets under his skin, and so she's traveled down to Miami, and he has unexpectedly invited her out for lunch. And so She joins him uh, at the Pick and Chicken, which is probably not the venue that (laughs) Kitty would have chosen for herself, but she's accepting the challenge that he's laying out. And I think this conversation really shows the tone of their relationship early on. Kitty jumped as Max reached across the table to touch one of the curls at her temple. I bet you rushed right out the minute you saw Roman Holiday and asked them to cut your hair just like Hepburn's, didn't you? He asked. At last, an opportunity to be flirtatious. Who wouldn't want to look like a princess? Did you go to school? College, I mean. Damn, he wouldn't be distracted. Nope, she replied. Where'd you get all those books? The usual places. I know where to find books, Max. You sure have a lot of questions. I want to know more about you. Do you travel much? Kitty stifled the urge to point out that he'd asked another friggin' question. Instead, she replied with a query of her own. Why should I? She smiled. Everything I need is in New York. He sat back against the booth. You're living in a small world if all you need is New York. It's true. New York has it all. It can't be true. How come? He grinned at her. Because you're not in New York right now. Must be something you need here. Kitty fiddled with the corner of her placemat. The urge to speak honestly bubbled up. Maybe it was his demeanor or his suggestive smile. He could see that there was more to her. Hadn't he said that? She thought of her last date, who had droned on about portfolios or something all evening before trying to grope her in the cab afterward. Max wanted her to talk about herself. She knew better than to do that, but the words came anyway. New York may be a small world, but I'm going to be at the top of it one day. That tells us so much about her right there. I love well-written dialogue. And again, I I always feel I'm insincere when I say how much I enjoyed a book, but what's the point of having guests on anyway if I don't like their book? So (laughs) I am sincere about it, and I like things like that. I like them going back and forth, very real conversation between two people. And after I read that scene, I sent you something on Twitter, and you sent me back that the pick and chicken, I I thought it was just you being a very clever writer, and I didn't even think (laughs) to to check into it. But I said, wow, pick and chicken, and you have... a menu that's shaped like a chicken there. What a great detail. <laughs> and you tweeted me back a picture of the menu, and I was blown away. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. I um, That is, again, that's the level of research that I do. I just, uh, <laughs> if I'm going to include a detail, I want it make, I want it to be as authentic as possible to the time. But um, and, I, and I found that menu, and I thought, there's no way I'm not going to mention this. <laughs> And it works. And yet that's part of the editing process. It really worked that you, as much as you love that, you didn't just use that so that it would be, oh, it's a a cool restaurant for them to go to. It does. She does think of it later in some context. It adds a little bit to the story. It's just a funny place. It's great. You're touching on the sense of taste there and smell and all of those things and taking her out of her element. That was a, that was a fun thing. And when you sent me that menu, I just thought that was great. (laughs) We're speaking with Amber Brock author of Lady Be Good, a novel. Visit her at amberbrock.net or at ambrockwrites on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Best-selling author Fiona Davis, who we interviewed about her sophomore novel, The Address, and will welcome back for her upcoming title, The Masterpiece, writes of Lady Be Good, quote, Kitty Tesler, a headstrong glamour girl, determined to move up in the world, 
steals the spotlight in Amber Brock's latest, a tour de force filled with intrigue and surprises. Amber, Fiona chooses the perfect word there, as she does often in her novel, and as I can tell you work hard to do here in your own writing. She says headstrong, and it's just what they would call a woman like Kitty at the time, but it occurs to me that you rarely hear about a man being called headstrong in any era. (laughs) So how did you go about handling the roles of women at the time and those they themselves thought appropriate for their gender so that Lady Be Good would appeal to, say, your students and to other 21st century readers? Well, I I always sort of bemoan the lack of really complicated female protagonists. And I think we get in popular culture, certainly television and movies, we get plenty of male protagonists like Don Draper, who are conflicted and challenging and hard to love. And yet they're intriguing and we want to follow them. And certainly Kitty is not anywhere near as morally questionable as Don Draper, but she, you know, I wanted to craft someone who would, who would be challenging. At the same time, because history is one of my great loves, I always want to create characters who are true to their era. It's jarring for me to see a character in a, in an era who is speaking like someone from 2018. I really want a character who represents the mainstream, for lack of a better word, someone who has really been shaped and molded by the social mores of the time, even if through their personal growth and their personal journey, they come to realize that they can challenge the status quo and they have their eyes open to other parts of the world and other ways of living. I still want very much for them to inhabit the era that they're in. Like so many of us, whenever, you know, we're, we're shaped by the time that we live in, we're shaped by the people around us. And it's the rare person who has a real bead on the ways that people will be thinking decades from now. So um, I really want to show the ways in which people are shaped by the time that they live in. And so Kitty is, you know, absolutely a product of her time. And and especially in the beginning has very strict beliefs about where her life is headed and only to have that challenged by her, her life experiences, which again, I feel like is something that a lot of us go through. You talked about her language there a little bit, and that's something else I wanted to bring up, just like the television box, because dialogue does so much heavy lifting in a good novel. There should be a big percentage that's just dialogue, and giving us a scene from that rather than, as you mentioned earlier, sitting around and just looking at the room and telling us everything about Queen Victoria's throne. So... In Lady Be Good, you have Mr. Tesla's assistant, Andre, for instance, another major character, saying, get your picture made rather than get your picture taken, as we might have said a few years ago. I don't even know. Maybe we maybe we just – we don't even think about it because it's not a process anymore. We do it on our phone. Mm-hmm. But that was one of those nice little – subtle details, subtle verb that I'm always on the lookout for when I read a book. And I enjoy it because it just passes you right by. You also don't stop and explain things, which is not something that I like to see happen in a book. I, I like it. I'd rather not get it than somebody in a movie or anything stop dead the plot to explain to me and show me a little bit of a dance of, hey, hey, check out this cool thing that I showed. So how did you harvest the slang and the voice of the 50s and then prune those down so that your characters didn't come out sounding like cliches out of a high school production of Grease. <laughs> well, I'm so glad that they didn't, yeah. And uh, and that is, again, something that I, I'm very sensitive to as a reader. Um, and I, I really, especially with Lady Be Good, can credit it entirely to my obsession with Turner Classic Movies, American Movie Classics. I am immersed in the films of the era Mid 20th century sitcoms. I grew up watching those and taping them um, off the television, and I probably still have some of those tapes somewhere. And, and I've always been a language person, I've always been a listener, and I pay very close attention to how people use language and in what settings they use it and how do they choose their words. I, I don't think it's eavesdropping if it's research, right? It doesn't. It's not um, morally questionable for me to be sitting around listening to people speaking. But, but yeah, I, I I think it is equally important that the 
words that the characters are speaking are doing the same work that the words in the narration are, that they're giving, uh, I always tell my creative writing students that the words are spices and some words are salt and pepper and you can use them a little bit more liberally. And then some words are cayenne pepper. And so if you use too much of it, then it, you know, people are going to notice it's going to be too strong and it's not going to taste good. And so you really have to find the right blend to give the effects that you want to give without over seasoning it. So um, I try to, to make sure that they don't come out sounding like, Hey, we're in the 1950s and, and it's a big song and dance production about that because we don't notice those things in our own conversations, in our own lives. We just, you know, we casually use these words. And so it's, equally important it's meaningful when my characters use them and that otherwise they're speaking just about how we would. Well, I'm going to remember that example with the spices and certainly give you credit for that. So I won't call it stealing. Thank you. Although I have to say you were, I'm already just sitting here thinking of that pick and chicken and now you're giving me <laughs> spices. So I'm starting to get a little bit hungry, but I will, I will soldier on here because we have a few more things that we wanted to talk about as we go through Lady Be Good. One is Kitty's father. He offers her an option other than the one available to women in the 1950s, namely settle down and get married. He suggests that she take over the hotel business, or he offers to allow her to by working her way up from the bottom. And that's one of those right turns that I didn't quite expect. You mentioned that there's a lack of female protagonists that you wanted to see more, and yet you didn't just go in to rewrite the same female protagonist. We think of the 50s and that post-war generation, and we think of them having gone through the Depression and being so such tough people. You know, they wanted their kids' lives to be better. And yet that's not what Mr. Tesler does with her. He's not a stereotypical 50s businessman. He's not yelling at her. He's really a, a friend to her. He's taken seriously the role of being both mother and father. And you could tell by the way that I'm talking about him like he's a real human being, how vividly you managed to paint it. And this is not a super thick book, everybody. It's not war and peace. So you hit it just right with him. And I did like the guy because I felt that I hadn't met him a thousand times before. I felt that he wasn't a two-dimensional figure where you just said, okay, I'll check off the father box and he's he's just <laughs> going to be like Larry Tate in Bewitched, you know, which is <laughs> the, the worst boss ever. And every every second he was threatening to fire Darren or Mr. Slate was the same way in the Flintstones, yes. all those shows, right? They were always the same. You were always on the verge of being fired and being offered a vice presidency and they treated the, <laughs> they either treated the daughters terribly or they treated them, especially with Kitty being an only child, it would have been very easy for her to be a disappointment or be very spoiled. And she is, she has some of the, the qualities where she's a little spoiled and some of the <laughs> disappointment, but it's not a caricature of a relationship. And I, I really like that. You talked about going through various drafts. How did Mr. Tesla grow in your mind so that he wasn't a stereotype, wasn't a cookie cutter, but he was something that when someone like myself gets their hands on Lady Be Good, I can feel affection for the guy and feel like he's somebody I really know. He's real. Well, thank you for the compliment. I, you know, it means a lot to me because I, you know, it is fun to talk about Kitty, but I put an enormous amount of work and thought into my secondary characters even down to very minor characters and thinking about their lives and, you know, their own rich inner world. You know, everybody is the protagonist of his or her own story. And so, you know, that's very true of Mr. Tesla. He felt really real to me. And it sounds like that might come across on the page. It's exactly what you say, that he and Kitty are a, a very small but very real family and together they went through a very trying time of, of losing his wife, losing her mother, which I think united them. And so he does have a soft spot for Kitty that might make him a little blind at times to some of her machinations. But um, I really dug deep into my sympathy for him without ever feeling sorry for him. And, and that was true of Kitty as well. He's definitely informed by his experiences, and you can see that the way that he reacts to the idea that Kitty would marry one of the Newport fellows and the polo club guys. And, um, you know, he's thinking about the 1920s and he's thinking about the Great Depression. But he he is informed by those experiences, but he's not locked into this traditional mold because they don't fit that traditional mold. They're not that traditional family and they have to be there for each other in a way that 
would not be the case if she had her mother there. And, you know, she, she talks about that she had nannies growing up, but that she and her father always made time for each other, that they're very, very close. And I think, too, with him, that he sees so much of himself in her, that he can't help but be very close to her without abandoning that that fatherly role, like they're not friends. And he definitely tries his best to bring the hammer down on Kitty and be a disciplinarian, but he still has so much love for her and so much concern for her that it helps him to be a different sort of father than might be expected in the 1950s. And when you reflect on it as a reader, you think about the book, you think about that relationship, listening to you talk about it, It's important that these other people do have those rich details and that they aren't any of them cookie cutters, that you put that effort in, for instance, to give Andre, who is her father's assistant, and he's hoping that maybe she'll marry him, encourages her to go out with him. You give him some details that he's an orphan, he doesn't have a family, how he got to have this job, how he worked his way up. You didn't have to do that, but you did it, and then that makes it all the more compelling to watch Kitty because we're reminded here that, hey, these these other people aren't just those actors that I mentioned, that they're there for a single scene. They have maybe one line. They're just an extra. Maybe they have no lines, and then they walk off. But this is so key to your story and keeping her in that crucible and making the final resolution of the plot satisfying to us because we say, hey, that that guy's kind of interesting, or at least he's a nice guy. And she's oblivious <laughs> to that early in the book, because she doesn't realize they have whole lives going on there. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And I, I adore Andre. He's probably one of my favorite characters that I've ever created. And I think it would have been very easy just to make him a, a plot device. But he became such a real person to me. I could see him so clearly in my mind and just sort of fell in love with him and and wanted to put him in the novel in a way that readers would fall in love with him too and say, but yeah, okay, so Kitty's got all this going on. That's great. What's he up to? You mentioned earlier her best friend, Henrietta Bancroft, Hen for short. She has a mother who is just as much a manipulator and a user as Kitty is, all with those same good intentions that pave the road to somewhere hot that is not Havana. (laughs) I'm Curious, when you thought about her, how you hoped readers would see her as a mirror to Kitty in the plot, or if you saw her rolling some other curlers, if you saw her serving some other purpose in the plot of your book? Yeah, Kitty Kitty definitely sees Mrs. Bancroft as, as the ideal that she's hoping to achieve. This is this beautiful society woman. She has all of this money. Everyone looks up to her. Everyone respects her. If they talk bad about her, they make sure to do it far away. You know, they're never going to get caught doing that. And that's what Kitty really ultimately wants. She wants the protection that status would afford her. She wants people to be deferential to her. And that's something that she has not experienced. But like with so much else in Kitty's experience, she's sort of willfully blind to the darker side of that, to Mrs. Bancroft's controlling nature, that that's, that that's not a good thing. She is exactly what Kitty wants to be, but Kitty doesn't see that that's a bad thing. And so she she is very much a mirror to Kitty in that way, but then also she helps to create Hen's story and Hen's growth because the mother's attempt to control Hen and to dictate her life to her is Hen's obstacle to overcome. And so, you know, I want especially a character as central as Hen to Kitty's story, I want her to have a moment of growth and I want her to have a compelling character arc in the same way that I hope Kitty does. But her story is playing out parallel to Kitty's. And I think it'd certainly be fun to see what is the version of Lady Be Good told through Hen's eyes because she's got this rich story going on. It just happens to be happening sometimes when Kitty can't see it. So, um, and, and that was so important to me that Hen and her, her mother be a very real source of conflict, not just for Kitty, but for Hen. You have another 50s detail in there, and that's the luxury of flying and the limitations at the time. For example, Kitty can't take her dog, Loco. And I didn't want to get to the end of the story without mentioning that she has that dog and the dog's name. You did mention Loco a little earlier, just not by name. Where did you find that particular detail about flying? And as a follow-up, I mentioned that you have three dogs. You rescued three dogs. Are any of them named Loco, or is Loco one of those composite characters we hear so much about? <laughs> so sadly, no dog named Loco, but her personality and her her look is based on my dog, Biddy. Okay. All of our dogs are rescues, so they usually come to us 
with a name and then we give them about 80 nicknames each. But <laughs> yeah. she definitely has the sort of personality of Biddy and she is sort of clingy like Vicky is. Vicky is my lap dogs. But yeah, I love researching and I, I saw a very funny thing on Twitter that somebody was saying, oh, I spent five hours researching Victorian toilets to write one sentence. And I have definitely <laughs> fallen into that trap before. I always say I love being a historical author in the internet age because it, it's such a perfect paradox. But there are so many people out there who have these very niche interests and they post it. They post everything they find online. And so I'm able to find all of these fabulous resources. I'm also really lucky to have a librarian in the family and uh, she's gone through and helped pull resources for me as well. But for the flight specifically, I found a couple of oral histories and articles about the golden age of air travel. And I, I love that they call it the golden age of air travel. I mean, certainly the food was good. There was more leg room, but the turbulence was way worse. So I can't imagine, you know, that you would think this is so much fun when you're bouncing around. But I found lots of pictures online. And then I found a fabulous site that's dedicated to Pan Am. It's called everythingpanam.com. And the everything is no exaggeration. I that's great. I spent untold hours on that website just clicking on everything. Someone has meticulously cataloged brochures, tickets, luggage tags, I mean everything. So I found out that dogs were not allowed on the flights from that website because I was reading a brochure saying here's everything you need to know before you fly because it was such a rare experience for most people that you would have to sit down and read a brochure to know how much luggage you could carry and, and what you could and couldn't carry on. It wasn't such a such a casual thing in the 1950s. But on the Everything Pan Am website, it's the collection. It's what the button on, on there is. And it has like ashtrays, this unbelievable collection of photos of ashtrays from the airlines or uh, air sick bags. And so I really had a lot of fun digging into that. And it, it was a shame that it, they only flew just for the one chapter. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun too. It was fun to be in that moment with them on a plane when and when it's so new and fresh air travel and maybe you'd only fly once in your life, not somebody at Kitty Station or Hens, but it was just a fun time to be there with them. And then also, and that's a plot device to how are you going to get Loco to Miami if you can't fly him there? And, you know, he's, he's not going to walk all that way. Right. <laughs> Our plane from Miami is about to touch down in New York City's Idlewild Airport. This is 10 years before it's renamed after JFK. But I have time for one final question, and that's what's up next in your writing career? Will you revisit Kitty, Hen, Andre, and the gang, or do you plan to start a whole new adventure? Well, I would love to explore Kitty's further adventures someday. I think she's the type of girl who is just going to always be getting into something interesting. I think there's an awful lot left to be explored with her. But at the moment, I'm spending a lot of time with a 1940s murder mystery set in Hollywood's studio system. So a transplanted Southern girl goes out to become a costumer. And she ends up getting mixed up with a starlet who later goes missing. And our costumer realizes she may be a potential suspect. She was the last one to see the starlet alive if she doesn't try to find out who done it first. Okay, well, you can get to work on that and send it to me again in advanced copy because I love that. I love to get these books that I love, but they never come fast enough. I was going <laughs> to say to you, okay, write up that one of Lady Be Good from Hen's perspective. I'll I'll take that. You, I'll, I'll give you a couple of weeks to finish that one. <laughs> that would be a, another great summer read. But, yeah, that'll do it, yeah. But I envy everybody who's listening now because they will not have read Lady Be Good yet. So you get to read it from the beginning and enjoy it all fresh, all new for you, and you will enjoy it, I'm sure. A lot of books do cross my desk. I have a big pile there, and it's great to have one that just reaches out and grabs you. Kitty's hand reaches out, grabs you, that manicured hand there, I'm sure, <laughs> a little dainty hand coming out of a book. Kind of a freaky image, but that's what it felt like. She said, hey, read read my story, which was nice. <laughs> so thank you so much for introducing me to Kitty Tesler and your other well-rounded cast of characters. I wish you the best of luck with your novel, and since all of these people do seem so real to me. I hope that you'll give them my regards next time you find yourself back in the 50s or maybe even just in a very old person's house that seems like you're in the 50s because I feel like it could be one of those Stephen King things where they, one of them comes to life. They are very vivid and it's a really fun story. I enjoyed it so much. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure.
Again, the book is Lady Be Good, a novel. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at historyauthor.com. And we hope you will click through there or even navigate using the Amazon banner on our homepage the next time you purchase anything from Amazon. That banner takes you through to Amazon, and Amazon.com gives us a small portion of every dollar you spend at no extra charge in your shopping cart. For just those few extra clicks, you can help us keep the flux capacitor on our time machine humming like usual. My thanks to Amber Brock for leading us onto the dance floor at so many 1950s hotspots. Visit her at amberbrock.net or at ambrockwrites on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And while you're at it, let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean, on Instagram at The History Author Show, or facebook.com slash historyauthor. That's it for this 50s installment of The History Author Show. I hope you'll join us in two weeks for our next all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio. And if you're an iTunes subscriber, please take a minute to leave us a review. Well, until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us today, and have a great week. The boys won the war and came home from the fight. The last night on Broadway was almost his night. But ever since then, it's a different street. Gone are the places where the gang used to be. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. 